my name is Jay Sugarman, and I want to welcome you to Museum Open House. This ongoing series features and highlights many of the outstanding museums and other cultural institutions. The main purpose of most programs is to inform viewers about current and upcoming exhibits, various programs, resources, and other opportunities that are available for the general public. Today via Zoom, we're fortunate to have as our guests, Anais Reyes. Anais is the Senior Exhibitions Associate of Curation at the Climate Museum, a nonprofit organization in New York City and the first museum dedicated to climate change and climate solutions in the United States. During the program, we'll learn why and how the museum came about. We'll go on a behind the scenes tour of its current exhibition entitled The End of Fossil Fuel. And in the process, come to better understand and appreciate the museum's overall mission and what visitors can look forward to experiencing and learning about. Let's start by meeting Anais and learning all about the Climate Museum. Welcome, so delighted you're able to be here. Hi, it's so great to be here. You know, a couple of months ago, I was fortunate to come across a terrific article in the New York Times about the Climate Museum, eager to find out more and have you inform viewers. But before we jump right to that, would you please start by just sharing a little bit more about your background, professional interest, and how you became associated with the museum? Yes, definitely. So um, I have a background in the arts. I went to art school. I studied painting and curatorial studies. And then I actually moved to New York uh, with the dream of working for contemporary art museums. Mm -hmm. And that happened for a little while. I kind of felt like maybe something was missing. I wasn't so sure. And then by 2017, I was really worried about climate change. I couldn't get, uh, you know, I really wanted to study the natural world. I couldn't get it out of my head. And so I was like, I think I have to go back to school to mm. study ecology, to study nature, to study climate change. And so I really felt like in order to solve the problem, I wanted to be part of the solution. I had to learn climate science. Hmm. And around this time too, I started interning at the Climate Museum. I Googled climate change museum and they were looking for interns and it was just, wow. you know, destiny. Nice, nice, um, nice. And so around this time I realized, you know, I thought I had to learn the science, but the science is proven. Like that's that's not the barrier. The barriers are social, they're political, they're other things. And so this was a really like powerful moment to come to that realization. And I feel really lucky that a lot of people come to the Climate Museum now with this, you know, aching question, what can I do? What are we supposed to do? And I kind of came to this issue in the same way. I had the same question and I was able to bring my own skills and my own background of studying the arts of working in museums. And now I get to use those as tools to empower other people to share how powerful the arts are to, you know, getting people mobilized and feeling empowered to address climate change. And I want to teach other people that, you know, you have the skills right now, whatever skills you have, you have the skills to like be part of this movement. Terrific message. Um, stepping back before we hear about what's going on today, a little bit about the history of the museum, why and how it came about, inspiration, overall mission, please. Sure. So the museum was founded in 2015 by Miranda Massey, who is our current director. And she um, was formerly a civil rights litigator. Uh, she'd been living in New York for a while. And when Hurricane Sandy happened in 2012, um, you know, she faced a lot of personal consequences from this natural disaster. And she kind of had this idea for a museum focused on climate change. Um, you know, there are other museums dedicated to, um, you know, ice cream and like arts and, you know, everything and ev anything and everything. And so she was like, there must be a museum dedicated to climate change. This is the biggest issue of our time. And there wasn't, when she looked, there wasn't. 
And so she kind of made it happen. Um, and so we've been doing public programs since about 20, late 2017, early 18. We've been bringing exhibitions, public art projects, events, public programs um, to the public to start this conversation, to bring people into this conversation. You know, for those who haven't had a chance yet to visit the current location, can you please give us a sense on how things are laid out, the arrangements and what we can look forward to? Sure. So our current exhibition is called The End of Fossil Fuel. And so um, we have one exhibition at a time at the Climate Museum because we're still scaling, we're still working to scale up. And so right now we have this location in Soho in New York City. Um, and basically the show is about how the fossil fuel industry is our biggest barrier to climate action. It's about the injustice of climate change and how, it, like I said before, it's not just a scientific issue, it's a social issue, it's a political issue, it's an economic issue. And how essentially the people who have done the least to cause the problem are the ones who are harmed first and worst and who are already being harmed right now. And so in, we face all of this really challenging information. People feel a lot of doom and gloom about climate change, we know. But we feel like um, we feel like we have to face the truth. And we feel like there is strength in joining with others to face the truth, to acknowledge our present and our past. And in order to build that future, that is um, in order to build a, a bright, just future, we do have to acknowledge our present and our past. And so I guess I'll start, this is the outside mm -hmm. of our current location. It's 105 Wooster Street in, in Soho. Um, next slide. And so the show starts off with, um, I guess I'll give an overview of the show first and then I can go into the specific images. But the show starts off with a, it kind of starts with a snapshot of where we are and then it looks into how we got here all while kind of making the point that we, like I said before, we need to acknowledge these things. We have to understand these things in order to build a positive future. And so in this location, um, we are looking at, the show starts with, a, a lenticular, maybe it's hard to see in this photo, but it's basically like if you stand on one side of this mm. uh, structure, you see one version of the map. Mm. And if you step, you know, five steps to your right, you see another version of the map. And so this is the snapshot of where we are right now in a global sense. We have a global sense, a national sense, and then a city sense mm. to kind of build this background. And so in this global sense, these two maps, one shows climate vulnerability and the other shows uh, cumulative emissions. And so you can take just a few steps to your left and to your right to see like, oh, there's so many countries that have contributed so little to the global carbon emissions, which as people might know, like have, if carbon emissions are what causes climate change, and so there are those countries that have contributed so little, and yet they are the ones facing floods. They are the ones facing heat waves. They are the ones facing things right now. And unfortunately, the there are, you know, the larger, richer countries, the 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 countries that were the colonizers. Um, they have emitted the most, but they are facing the impacts the least. And so we have to look at in order to create that just future? How do we fix this imbalance? How are we going to address this problem? Very Next. interesting to hear. And I know even in country today, uh, the difference in social classes yes. and how climate change affects us uh, various degrees like the countries. But for now, let's continue to move on and hear some more, please. Yeah, that's exactly it. That kind of gets into this next slide. So I said there's the global scale and this is the national scale. So even though the U.S. is relatively safe in comparison to other some other countries that are experiencing really severe impacts right now, 
There are also pockets of severe impacts in the U.S. And again, it's usually based on things like race and socioeconomic factors and class and historical uh, disinvestment in communities. So this map of the U.S. shows it pulls out these different stories from across the U.S. Mm. Um, kind of showing those impacts that are happening. So it shows stories from California, the wildfires in California and the people who were harmed um, from how people were unfairly harmed because of those fires or how farm workers in the Southwest are, you know, the people who pick the food that we eat. They don't have protection from the heat waves that are now happening and it is climate change is unfair to them in that way. So how will we protect them? So these are all little snapshots like that. Oh, very helpful to understanding the overall issue. So this section is the New York City uh, scale of those two previous photographs. This is the injustices that are happening at the city scale. And this is a story that happens in different cities all across the US. Mm -hmm. So basically this part of the exhibition shows how redlining overlaps with increased temperatures across New York City. So places that were historically disinvested in, people that were historically disinvested in, and people that faced racist policies 100 years ago when it came to buying homes and trying to you know, start lives and livelihoods, those same areas of cities are the ones that are now facing higher temperatures. I think it's as, as much as over 10 degrees higher because wow. there's not trees, because there's not uh, mm -hmm. infrastructure that is meant to combat heat. And so even though there were racist policies policies 100 years ago, we are still living through those racist policies in terms of climate change. Very similar issue in different pockets of the city of Boston and our area, as well as many other places, but interesting to see the New York City as we move on. And so this is uh, a, a photograph of one whole side of the exhibition. And I included it because we very specifically created this show, um, this, this side of the show to be black and white, to kind of be, um, we acknowledge, like I said before, we acknowledge that it's challenging, that it's upsetting, that it's hard, that it's a little bit doom and gloomy, but basically the rest of the show, it kind of transforms into a burst of color. And we wanted people to psychologically read it as mm. that transformation, that possibility, that potential. Nice, nice. And so this goes into, this is kind of, um, I guess all of those three previous parts were the snapshot of the present. And this is where we go to, well, how did we get here? Mm -hmm. And so we start here is where we start. And then there through the center of the room, there are a lot of panels that continue going into the past, both distant and recent. But this is where we start to explain um, the injustices that we are currently seeing that are based on primarily race, primarily income, things like that, those injustices have roots stretching all the way back to the Industrial Revolution, all the way back to colonialism and slavery. And so, as you'll see, so this is also part of, along the back wall of the exhibition, we have this mural. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of hard to get a full, I don't think we have anything that has a full snapshot. It's mm -hmm. kind of hard to get the whole mural in one picture, sure. but it follows a similar progression of like this dreary black and white to this burst of color and the the black and white focuses on like that that unjust past the it, the imagery goes back to the industrial revolution into slavery and in the middle you can see in this photo there's it's a little bit of a transformation into the fight for justice is kind of we we separated the middle the mural into three parts and this one sh this photograph shows the first two parts the past and then the, the what we kind of consider the present, the fight for justice. Very interesting to hear the background thinking as we go through the tour. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of trying to show more of the mural, the size of the mural. Um, 
I guess I'll add the the mural was created by with the help of an artist and illustrator, R. Gregory Christie. And we basically commissioned this piece because we felt it was important for people to like see the process of change, of transformation, to kind of start to be able to envision what that future piece looks like. Because right now we're, you know, we're in the thick of things. All we hear is bad news. And it really is a challenge to see what that future could be, to imagine what that future could be. But there's a lot of scholarship on how envisioning futures is the first step to building them. And especially how artists play a role in envisioning those futures, how scientists play a role in uh, creating those futures and how something like a mural has the power to be like, okay, we see what's happening. We, we just talked about all this really challenging information, but in order to move forward, we have to know that there is a forward to reach. We have to know that there is a future to be had. And so, like I said, this mural was broken into three parts, the past that was doomy, gloomy and gray, the middle, that's kind of the present, that's the fight, that's the struggle that we acknowledge is happening, that has to happen. And then a future, this climate just future, we're trying to um, start to put that seed in people's heads of like, it's there, imagine it, what do you imagine? What can we imagine together? You know, coincidentally, there's a wonderful exhibition right now at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem here, Our Time on Earth. And there's wonderful creative visions through multidisciplinary approach of positive possibilities with regard to climate change. Mm -hmm. Uh, So as you say, definitely out there a lot of... uh, very thoughtful, creative people working on this big issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this photograph looks at the center of the room. And this is where we get into, um, I guess, a lot of little details about how we got here. And so we have these different panels, sacrifice zones, fossil fuels. The next one says Exxon New, it's kind of cut off. But we tell these different stories of Um, for example, in this photograph, the people who live in Louisiana, who live near petrochemical processing facilities and how they face, I think it's like 50 times higher rates of cancer, the highest rates of cancer in the world, and how that kind of injustice to that community is just built into our system. And we don't really know about it. We don't really think about it all that often, but it's in order to run a world on fossil fuels, in order to you know have the thing that is creating climate change there are other people who are suffering there are other issues that are happening Mm -hmm. and so we're kind of breaking down these little uh pockets of like what this big picture we're breaking down this big picture essentially and so like these also show the history of the climate the the beginning of the climate justice movement was Mm -hmm. in the 1970s when environmental justice is a relatively young field and so the i believe robert bullard who is 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 called the father of environmental justice i believe mm. he you know he's still alive this is still something that is people are, have been working on this for for decades which feels like a long time but at the same time people have only been working on this for for decades right. and so the idea that uh, one thing that we talk about at the museum is that this idea of non-inevitability, um, which is basically like things didn't have to be this way. There was no, uh, things feel like destined to be as they are sometimes. And you really don't even have to look back that far to realize like, oh, this was a, this was a decision that someone made Um you know, however many decades ago, if we look at the Exxon new panel, I'm not sure if I have a picture of it more clearly, but the Exxon new panel goes into how uh, fossil fuel companies knew about the impacts of Mm. fossil fuel products, knew about the impacts to climate change, about how it would raise temperatures um, as early as the 60s, 70s. And instead of, you know, doing something about it, they 
had this whole media strategy to sow doubt in the public mm. and it, it set us back so long that now people are really fighting for the fossil fuel industry to be held accountable because the overwhelming amount of emissions weren't uh, you know, put into the atmosphere until after mm. 2000, after, um, after 1990. Um, and so after this, there was an investigation in, I believe, 2015 that uncovered that Exxon knew. And so what do we do with that information? How do we hold them accountable? How do we make this a story with a just ending after, you know, a company decided to just choose profits over global safety? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, in the um, seven or eight minutes we have left, Oh, Just yes. want to make sure we cover um, any particular areas that you'd like. So let me know how you'd like to proceed as we continue. Sure. I feel like we should turn to the Action Center. Um, I think we can start here. Yeah. And so I guess I, I there are a few other panels that they also talk about the successes and the victories of the climate justice movement and of recent, you know, political wins to pass climate legislation. And so there is a back and forth of like, we, yes, there is challenging things, but yes, there are things that we need to celebrate, that we need to appreciate, that we need to build off of. And so this action center, this is something that we started including with every program a few years ago. We basically realized we couldn't just teach people. We couldn't just show people art and like leave them feeling whatever feelings they had. We had to channel that energy whether it was sadness or anger or, you know, empowerment, excitement, based on whatever artist, based on whatever program, we had to channel that energy into action. And so we have the Action Center as like the final piece of this exhibition as well. And so basically at the Action Center, we have five different actions that you can take. And you can, kind of, if you go to the next slide, I think we'll see more clearly. So this is, you can, uh, these are kind of the five actions behind the people. You can go up to these little folders on the wall and take a sticker. Each action, the five actions are, I will talk about climate justice. I will contact my representatives. I will oppose the fossil fuel industry and I will vote climate. Mm. And then there's actually a fifth one that's just, I will, and it's blank. And people leave really beautiful message. You know, it's it's pick your own adventure and people leave really <laughs> interesting and profound, varied messages in those stickers too. Sure. And so basically people take a sticker. Um, hopefully the next photo is of the sticker wall. Oops. I think it's coming up. Okay. We well, actually, if you go to the, yeah, if you go to the next one, that's a better, it'll help build the picture better. But basically people could take a sticker, take the action that they want to commit to. They'll write on the tables, their name, some like a date, a little message, and then they will put their sticker on the wall. And over the course of the, the months that the show has been up, um, the stickers have accumulated. Uh, yeah, as you can see right there, this is a relatively recent picture. Mm -hmm. And so hundreds of thousands of people um, basically people who have stood where you're standing people who came to the climate museum for similar reasons that you did people who have similar worries and fears and hopes mm -hmm. um you know they're committing to an action they're committing to do something they learn something and they want to do something about it and that sticker on the wall is like the visual uh commitment the visual <laughs> social contract of like we're all in this together and it's a really effective tool. It's not just an, in, it's fun to be, have this interactive, you know, activity in the museum, but it's also a really good display of the collective, of the community that is formed through the museum, of um, the shared care and energy that people are really willing to bring, that people are looking for. Um, and so a lot of, there's a lot of really beautiful, like I said, messages on these stickers and, it's really fun to just kind of go up every, you know, I have the pleasure of working there. So I'll go up every once in a mm. while and, and see other, what new messages people have left. No, that's very uplifting. Mm -hmm. 
And then I'll clarify the, I'll just clarify the tables that I kind of skipped over. It's like where, if you want to write a postcard to your representative about Mm -hmm. what you just learned about the show, then people tend to like stay at those tables and, and really, you know, we have some people really think about what they want to say and some people write poems, some people Mm -hmm. make little doodles. And it's always, again, really interesting to see what people respond to and what they want to share. Nice, nice. What have been some of the programs and other events related to the museum? So we have had a lot of programs. We kind of tried to make our programs as interdisciplinary as possible, uh, because like I said at the beginning, every, every, there's a, so many people are so worried about climate change that we want to make entry points and pathways into this conversation, into the movement. We want to make it as easy as possible for everyone to connect And so we have all a range of things. We just recently had a teach-in with New York Renews, which is a a coalition of organizations working towards climate legislation in New York State. Uh, We just hosted a book launch with Willow Defabo, who is the founder of Atmos Magazine. She writes a lot about deep ecology. We just had a panel about the National Climate Assessment which for the first time in its history included justice and art. Mm. And here is a photo of a high school program that was about colonialism and world making and kind of looking into the history of how things in the past, you know, have their tendrils in the present and in the future and how can we this essentially the question that the big question that we're facing is how do we bring about a climate just future and so we do have a range of programs a range of approaches a range of ages a range of audiences nice nice well i know the exhibition's going to be up and available through april 28th i believe um either now or beyond that how can viewers and others stay informed about current and upcoming developments. Mm-hmm. So you can follow us on social media at Climate Museum um, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. And you can also sign up for our newsletter on our website at climatemuseum.org slash follow. Terrific, terrific. Well, Anaris, I want to thank you again for taking the time to be here. Very informative very thoughtful approach and definitely the future will make some differences based on this exhibition and many other efforts that are happening throughout the country, throughout the world. So there is hope and I think very encouraging future for all of us involved with regard to climate change. So thank you for adding this to our understanding. Thank you. I'm so glad that I could share it with your audience. Also want to thank those of you watching for joining us and hope you'll be able to tune in next time. 